Good morning, everyone. We are live, as it says on my screen. Uh, we are in a very worthwhile book talk. I'm going to begin by turning this over to Ambassador James Jeffries to introduce all of our panelists, and then we will be off to the races. Thank you very much, Deb, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. It's a particular honor for me today to introduce uh, this discussion on the new book by our own Wilson Center Middle East fellow, uh, David Ottaway. Uh, I have a copy of the book right here. Uh, it is fascinating in every respect. Uh, it tracks with my own experiences as a U.S. government official and as a think tank uh, representative in discussions with the enigmatic uh, Crown Prince MBS uh, over the past few years. I have seen him immediately after the murder of uh, uh, Mr. Khashoggi. I have seen him at his best. I've seen him at his worst. And David captures the very complicated nature of this individual right to a T, looking forward to what options he will have as he tries to simultaneously navigate his way in a new Middle East while trying to reform uh, the Saudi Arabian society, uh, which is in much need of modernization. Uh, today, uh, the discussion will be moderated by longtime NPR correspondent, uh, Deb Amos, and joining uh, David uh, in the discussion is Ambassador Chas Friedman. Uh, Chas is currently a senior fellow at the Watson Institute at Brown University and was a former U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia. So back to you, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am always delighted to read a journalist's book, um, a member of the tribe, and certainly from David Ottaway, who I have picked his brain on a number of occasions before I went to the kingdom. But the reason that I think that journalism, um, journalist books about uh, places that are difficult to penetrate are instead of page after page of opinion, it's page after page of actual fact. And fact builds a picture of Saudi Arabia that is always surprising. And even I, and I've been covering it for more than 20 years, the, the facts are what is so interesting. So David, I wanna start with you and I want you to paint a picture of this enigmatic leader who, um, as you write in your book, is rather isolated. His friends from the UAE are not so close anymore. He is you know, constantly reminded of the death of Jamal Khashoggi and the, his goals and, and big dreams when he first came to office are not going his way. Can you just tell us who this man is now and, and where he is um, in terms of power? You are muted. Thank you. Deborah, um, it's not easy to answer because this guy is incredibly complicated. Um, he is full of hubris. He is full of big dreams. He is ruthless. Uh, he's impulsive. <laughs> It's like the pieces of a Rubik's cube trying to put him together. Um, and he has come to power with no inherent legitimacy because the way you come to power in Saudi Arabia is through proving your ability to run government or uh, you know, have important positions, whether you're a minister of defense or minister of, of national security or or interior or something, you have, you prove yourself before you are considered for the kingship. This guy had nothing to show in terms of ability to run a government or even part of a government. So he came to power in a very unusual, unique way for Saudi Arabia. We've never seen a king or he's crown prince, but he'll be king shortly. Um, we've never seen a person like this come to power in Saudi Arabia in such a fashion. So it is not easy to, um, to, to say, you know, what kind of person he's going to become, which is what we all want to know. That's a huge conundrum. And one of the conundrums that I talk in the first chapter about the conundrums surrounding um, Saudi Arabia, but I use him 
as the embodiment of a larger national um, problem for Saudi Arabia, which is their quest for Arab leadership and global recognition. He is, he is a wonderful, um, um, he embodies all the problems that Saudi Arabia has had in establishing its Arab leadership, you know, well before he became crown prince. And um, so for me, he's a very good symbol of their problems for leadership, their shortcomings. And, um, and, uh, and that's what I use him for in this book, is just sort of a, the embodiment of, of larger national problems Saudi Arabia has been having for decades. And this came home to me when I, I, I started looking back when I first started writing, writing about this, uh, Saudi Arabia. And I discovered my first article was in October 1972, when Zaki Amani, the oil minister, proposed to the US government that Saudi Arabia would provide an endless supply of oil if the United States would allow Saudi oil into the uh, United States duty-free. We got no response from anybody. Um, but that was, uh, as I look back at my early articles, I could see that the problems they were having back then still haunt them or challenge them to this day. So it was a good reminder of the problem Saudi Arabia has had in this asserting its leadership and its uh, its own stability and security have been have been with it you know, since 1970 1970s. So I was 20 years after you. I came in in the 90s uh, in the first Gulf War. Um, I want to say to everyone who is uh, tuned in with us, um, we welcome you to submit questions to our email at mep at wilsoncenter.org or by tagging at William Center MEP via Twitter. And um, probably in about 30 minutes, we will come to questions. Um, I want to ask uh, Ambassador Freeman a, a, about a small thing. You mentioned, David, you mentioned his comment about it in the first couple of, maybe the first or second chapter, and then you come back to it later on in the book. And this notion that one of the things that MBS does that you think Ambassador Friedman is his undoing is to stop the those meetings that they have um, uh, where they let the population come or they let you know other other royals. Why, why do you think that he canceled them and what do you think it's costing him to do it? Um, I think one of the he is a transformative figure obviously uh, primarily in domestic policy I think although um, he's been very active and unsuccessful for the most part on, on foreign affairs. Um, Saudi Arabia is, uh, has always been an authoritarian uh, system, but it was tempered by shura, that is the Islamic practice of uh, forming consensus through consultation uh, by, the, by the existence of the majlis, which is the open meeting to which you referred, Deborah, and uh, by religious egalitarianism and family and tribal ties. Um, it has never been a dictatorship. Uh, the king, uh, for example, King Fahad told me that in his entire 50 years in public life, he had only once made a decision by himself when he presided over the council of ministers, the cabinet on Monday afternoons, um, he, would call, he would call the discussion into order. He would listen to it. He would ask everybody to submit a vote on a little chit. And unless there was an overwhelming approval of whatever was under discussion, he would remand it for further discussion. He never cast the tie vote. Um, this system had its merits. Um, it, um, uh, it, 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 it ensured against um, uh, risk. Uh, it produced stability. It neutralized opposition because of its inclusiveness. Uh, but it also frustrated the rising generation of Saudis who had not been born in the mud brick houses without electricity of their parents, but in 
ultra modern air conditioned equipped buildings. Um, uh, they were not parochial. They were not um, uncosmopolitan. Quite the opposite, aware of other uh, sorts of lifestyles. And uh, so, what Mohammed bin Salman has done uh, is short circuit all this. Uh, he has fundamentally changed the constitutional order in Saudi Arabia in the interest of pushing domestic reform, which he has done with great vigor. I think this is rational. I think it is enormously popular with young people in the kingdom. And it is the source of his legitimacy, which, as David indicated, did not come in the traditional manner. Um, Ambassador, let me ask you one more question on, on this legitimacy issue. And that is, yes, he is popular with young people because you see it on Twitter, but what does that get you ultimately um, to have a big Twitter following if you are a leader of a rich country uh, in the middle of a bad neighborhood? Uh, well, the first thing to, to note is that the demographic pyramid in Saudi Arabia has a very broad base. An enormous number of Saudis are under the age of 18. Um, over half, I believe. So um, popularity with young people uh, is enormously important. It's a tremendous source of support. Uh, I think he's also popular, uh, or at least respected, by many of those in the older generation who are technocrats. But they fear him. And with good reason, as David mentioned, he's shown that he can be completely ruthless. Uh, so. Um, uh, I think uh, the, the, the bottom line is, perhaps when I was there as ambassador during the Gulf War, I practically lived with the royal family for seven months. Um, I probably had more contact with the extended royal family than all of my predecessors or successors combined because of the intensity of the moment. No decision could be made in those days without consulting with uh, a very wide swath of the, the general public, uh, the merchant uh, princes, the wealthy, uh, and the, uh, the lineages that derive from Abdulaziz, the founder of the kingdom. Uh, there were 27 lineages that I counted at that time that had to be consulted on any important topic. Now, if you think of a political system as a table with legs, this was one that had 27 legs. It's kind of hard to turn over a table with 27 legs. <laughs> uh, it is now a pedestal table. It has a single uh, source of authority, and that is Mohammed bin Salman and his father. And um, I would argue you could overturn that much more easily. Uh, so having support from the general youth in the kingdom is the best guarantee of stability. And I expect this man to be around for a very, very long time, regardless of what foreigners may think of him. Um, David, does Mohammed bin Salman outrun what happened with Jamal Khashoggi? Or let me put the question this way. If, if Jamal Khashoggi was still alive, would the profile for MBS be different? Um, is that the one mistake or was it just a um, show on who he, who he is? Uh, definitely his, his, uh, his reputation in the movie. I mean, uh, he took a tremendous fall, just like Icarus, as a result of, of ordering or approving, however you want to put it, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. And 2018 to me, when it, it's all summed up. He came, he came to the United States in, in March of 2018, and he put on a tremendous show uh, of convincing the American uh, media uh, titans of, of Wall Street and the uh, and uh, Silicon Valley and just about everybody. And he was the first Saudi royal who actually sought out meetings with the editorial boards of the Washington Post, the New York Times, 
uh, LA Times, uh, Wall Street Journal. I mean, and then he met, he, he actually managed to, to um, touch in some way or invite to dinner to practically everybody in the United States that was interested in Saudi Arabia. This was an extraordinary show. We have never seen a Saudi royal put on a show like this. This was in March and April 2018. And, you know, less than six months later, Jamal Khashoggi uh, was dead and murdered by, by his government. And the, the fall has just been, to me, is just really striking. Now, the issue is, you know, Icarus drowned after he went up to the sun and his wings melted and he fell into the sea. Um, uh, in the case of uh, Mohammed bin Salman, I would say he's still struggling in the waters, uh, particularly the international waters, to um, stay afloat and reassert, uh, come back in the, above water, if you will. And I think he's really found himself very marginalized in the Arab world. He no longer has even any control over the Gulf Cooperation Council, which are the six uh, monarchies of the Arab monarchies of the Gulf. He's lost control of that. Uh, and even interesting, the most interesting uh, um, new formation of alliances is between Iraq, Egypt, which is reasserting its, its role in the, in the Arab world, and Jordan. It's a tripartite alliance. The leaders met, uh, I think it was in June in Baghdad, and, and the, the foreign ministers have finished another meeting. But here's a new Arab alliance from which Saudi Arabia is absent. And so I think he's still quite marginalized in the Arab world. And what he did to Jamal Khashoggi um, is responsible for it. And by the way, we're almost up to the third anniversary, we're October 2nd, of Jamal's murder. So um, uh, it's at least timely to be discussing this issue. Um, anyway, I think he has a long way to go to uh, recover uh, from his fall. One thing that struck me, David, in your book is how you detail what he lost, how much money walked out of the country. Uh, how different his plans have to be, state capitalism versus private uh, uh, capitalism to, to, to shape your economy. I, I, was, I was surprised and struck by it. How, how much, um, uh, what a price he paid. Well, he's had to, uh, he's, he, he, for an investment there, I won't say it's ended, but it really took a hit right afterwards. And it's slowly been, he has all these giga, calls them giga projects, you know, mega projects. Well, in Saudi Arabia, of course, everything has to be bigger and better than anything else. He calls them giga projects. And so there are uh, companies that are coming back slowly to, to uh, help build these giga projects, like Naom, the, the, the city uh, that he's trying to build from scratch in northwestern uh, Saudi Arabia, which is he estimates is going to cost $500 billion to build. Well, that's a lot of money. And uh, Bechtel has just signed on to be the general contractor up there. And, and the, they've made a, uh, he has made a deal with, uh, he wants to develop green hydrogen and, mm -hmm. and use uh, uh, solar and wind power entirely to to, to, uh, to uh, power the city of Mayo, but also to create green hydrogen. So um, he's, he's slowly getting people to come into these mega projects, a lot of tourist projects, but the scope of investment is not what it was before um, Jamal Khashoggi's murder. So, Ambassador Friedman, I want to ask how long this lasts. I, you know, I remember working with a Swedish correspondent in Israel, and her diplomats were never allowed to shake Yitzhak's <clears throat> hand because, no, I'm sorry, Shamir's hand, because 
he, as a young man, was part of a group that were responsible for the death of a Swedish ambassador, but he was prime minister, so what? So, you know, there, the, 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 there's a moment that you're tagged with it, but you still can function. And, I, and, I, and that's my question. Can uh, MBS function with this crime uh, that follows him around? Uh, well, I'd like to offer a different perspective than, than David on this. Um, um, the death of, of Jamal, of my friend Jamal Khashoggi, was not, um, is not a barrier to uh, MBS's dealings with China, India, Russia, uh, or other countries outside the core um, Atlantic uh, region. Uh, nor is it a barrier to capital from these companies, these countries coming into Saudi Arabia. Uh, so in effect, uh, the ostracism he is suffering from the West uh, is having the effect of pushing Saudi Arabia more away from the West and into, into uh, the arms of these rising and resurgent uh, powers. Um, we just had, uh, just had an example of that. The second point is that in the Arab world, the combination of Egypt, Jordan, and Iraq is nothing new. That was the Arab Cooperation Council which was the antidote to the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, that in the run up to the Iraq war of uh, uh, which led to uh, uh, our effort to liberate Kuwait. Uh, the only missing piece is Yemen. Um, so uh, the collusion between uh, Baghdad, um, Amman and, and Cairo um, is being reinstated in a sense. Uh, so, uh, so I'm not sure that that's quite as ethical as David makes it out to be. But, you know, I think the key issue is um, uh, to answer your, your question specifically, in the West, yes, memories will fade, uh, new deals will be done, um, opportunities will present themselves. And over time, um, uh, this issue will fade. It will not go away. Uh, I do not think it will ever go away. Uh, but it will fade in importance. And in the meantime, this man is leading uh, a tremendous change in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's curbed the religious vigilantes, the Matawain. Um, he's brought the reactionary elements of the ulama, the council of, of, uh, of religious scholars under control. He's opened theaters. He's instituted uh, musical performances, dance performances. Um, movies. Um, he has uh, continued and accelerated uh, the empowerment of women. Uh, and uh, this began earlier, but it's really now a strong uh, trend. And he's quite popular with women for this reason. Um, he's addressed the fiscal deficit that the Saudis have always had by instituting taxes, something unheard of in the kingdom. And uh, he's uh, I think gained popularity by his assault on the, the ultra wealthy, uh, the shakedown of the sheikhs, as it is called. Um, this is not unpopular. Um, the Vision 2030 uh, program that he's instituted is, in effect, a recasting by McKinsey and Company of plans that have long been uh, in the Ministry of Plans. I remember Hisham Nader, who was Minister of Planning telling me all about what is now happening. The difference is that it is happening. And finally, uh, despite the bungling of the war in Yemen, um, Mohammed bin Salman has awoken a, a sort of Saudi nationalism that we've never seen before. Uh, people want their king, the kingdom to be assertive. Um, that is where David's observation about uh, the lack of traction in the broader Arab world comes home to hurt. Um, and I would say that the great failures so far of Mohammed bin Salman have all been in foreign policy, but there have been some successes. Uh, he's cut Saudi Arabia's losses in Syria, um, begun to a uh, process of rapprochement there. He gulled Mr. Trump um, into, uh, uh, um, or he, he used Mr. Trump's uh, uh, autocrat envy uh, to his advantage. He, he seduced Mr. Kushner, or was it the other way around? Um, and and he, he has, um, uh, I think, you know, a terrible bungle, bungled uh, intervention in, 
Yemen, which was wrong from the start. Uh, it was a product of hubris and, and uh, assertiveness that was not well thought through. Um, he is engaged in an entente with Egypt, notwithstanding Egypt's uh, embrace of, of this other group. Um, uh, he has stood with the UAE against Islamist democracy in the form of the Muslim Brotherhood or Hamas. Um, he uh, is now re-embracing Turkey, which um, shows some flexibility. And uh, he's certainly engaged in real politique with Israel, bringing out into the open intelligence con connections that were long, long concealed, but not selling out the Palestinian cause. Uh, as some accuse the UAE of having done. So I think uh, the opprobrium that he faces in the West is likely to fade as, uh, and, and they don't impede, it doesn't impede his outreach to rising and resurgent powers uh, who practice classical realism and diplomacy, unlike us. I'm gonna um, ask one more question before I go to the long line of questions that we're starting to get. And, and this is it, David, because it strikes me that um, for the first time ever, we have an external opposition. Uh, the op I remember the opposition in Saudi. It was like that guy in London. And then there was another guy in Washington and it was the two of them. And now it's you know a group of people who can get a young Saudi woman out of Hong Kong if she's running away from her abusive father. You now have, um, you know, a human rights group in London. Um, I get notes all the time from people, Saudis, who want to talk about this. David, uh, is, is that one of the things that is the result of the murder of Jamal, or was it long overdue? Well, I don't know if it was long overdue. Can you hear me? Am I yeah. on? Yes. Yeah. I don't know if it was long overdue, but it certainly the extent and depth and breadth of the opposite, external opposition is new. And this was brought home to me when one Saudi pointed out, he said, go to the UN um, Refugee Commission and see how many Saudis have, have applied for asylum outside Saudi Arabia, of course. And I did, and it was like 2,400 Saudis have applied for asylum. This is, this is unheard of. The Saudis used to brag, and they were very proud of the fact that the, their students that went abroad always came back. They were so attached and dedicated to, to Saudi Arabia that they would come back, and that was true. But uh, since Khashoggi's murder in, in particular, the number of uh, groups and organizations. Dawn, you didn't mention Dawn, which is right here in Washington, right, D.C. Right. Democracy for the Arab World Now, which was Jamal Khashoggi's project, uh, which he, he did not succeed in getting uh, getting going before he was murdered. Um, that's very active. Alkist, which is, I think, in London. Maybe that's the group you're referring to. But I, you now get uh, not to mention Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, but what's different is these are Saudis that are organizing. Now, external oppositions in the Arab world have not uh, fared well in terms of coming to power at some point. So you have to ask yourself, um, uh, in all truthfulness, and, uh, <coughs> what, what what does this mean? Is it it's certainly new and different, but can it turn into like a snow, snowball effect where they begin to uh, gather uh, support inside Saudi Arabia? I don't know. Um, we're, uh, it's not the first group of uh, Arab activists that have had to operate from abroad. The Muslim Brotherhood is very much that way now. Um, but if you're not at home and part of the, you know, the chessboard at home, um, mm -hmm. it's a very unsettled question how much difference it makes. And this is a question that we have. I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have any names for the people who are asking questions. So forgive me for that. But I think this, this goes to Ambassador Friedman. If the Majlis and the Shura helped manage opposition in the past, will the suppression of dissent intensify? So that's an internal, more of an internal question. 
Yeah, I think the the, the suppression of intents of, of dissent internally is already quite strong. Um, uh, the one forum where people could dissent in the past was the mosque. Um, and very af often on, after the Friday prayers, people would stay on and discuss overtly political topics. Uh, this is one reason that the Mukhabarat, the Ministry of Interior Intelligence Arm, uh, so carefully monitors what goes on in mosques. Um, and what has happened in Saudi Arabia is that uh, uh, the national practice of of progress without change, as I as I call it, um, has been overrun uh, by um, a whole range of factors, including uh, the education of many people abroad, the education of women. Most most students in Saudi universities are female, um, and um, uh, the the uh, the development of less austere and controlling religious. Uh, 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 professions of religious faith, um, along with technology. And one of the notable things about Mohammed bin Salman is that he is, like many, uh, like probably most Saudi, younger Saudis, he's technologically literate. Uh, and I think David calls him a bit of a nerd. Um, you know, he's, he is not the, the traditional wise Bedouin um, uh, that we think of. Um, so uh, I think uh, internal dissent um, uh, is, being, is strengthening um, even as it's repressed for several reasons. Great wealth produces high walls between the wealthy and ordinary people. The majlis, which is a unique institution that provides a sort of Jacksonian level of contact between the rulers and the ruled um, is less frequent. Um, it's now subject, you have to go through security barriers and checks, you can't just walk in the way you did. Um, so the dialogue is more constrained. And then there's the element of fear. And that I think is where the Khashoggi murder has, has, its, has its impact. But the, you know, I, I'd argue that you would have gotten the growth of a, a Saudi diaspora in any event for quite a number of reasons, some of them having to do with changed social mores, uh, LGBTQ issues, for example, uh, which are anathema to Saudi society, but quite tolerated in the West. Uh, so uh, people uh, have many reasons, not just political, uh, for seeking a residence abroad that they perhaps didn't before. Yes, indeed. And uh, I have been in touch with LGBT Saudis who get asylum here and in Canada. And it's kind of amazing how A, underground it is, and B, what the numbers are. I, I want to ask David, I, we're getting questions now. We'll change the subject a little bit. Can MBS recognize Israel, or would that be a coffin nail for his leadership? Would he wait till he becomes king? What would be the ramifications for Saudi leadership in the Muslim world? I want to engage both of you on this one. Let's start with David. Well, you know, they're under the table. They're already dealing with each other. And um, the Saudis, the rationale, the need for a country like Israel to come to the help of Saudi Arabia is growing day by day as we retreat from the Gulf. We're already taking out, taking out our Patriot missiles from Saudi Arabia and our, our involvement there, military involvement has, has decreased. And we discovered when the Iranians rained 25 cruise missiles and drones down on Saudi uh, oil facilities in September two years ago that um, Neither Saudi Arabia nor the United States had the radar or the missiles available to counter this. The Israelis have the Iron Dome system. And I'm already hearing that there are talks between the Saudis and the Israelis about uh, the Saudis um, buying into the Iron Dome system, uh, which has proven its, its worth and the rain of missiles and uh, and all kinds of stuff from from uh, 
from Hamas into, uh, into Israel. So um, what, I guess what I'm saying is that Saudi Arabia desperately has always sought for some other ally than the United States because they couldn't be sure of the US uh, would come to their rescue. And when the Iranians sent all those missiles to two years ago into uh, to, to destroy and actually knock out, knock out about 50% of Saudi oil production, you, Trump, the great hero of MBS um, said, we don't have to do anything. Our American interests aren't at stake. So that, if, if there were ever <laughs> an indication that the Saudis need somebody else than the, than the United States to look for for protection, particularly against cruise missiles, the kind of modern warfare we're beginning to, to take place and see take place out there. The Israelis are perfectly situated to provide it. Now, can they go public with this relationship? Um, I don't think they're ready yet to go public. We saw for, for the first and only time a debate, a public debate between the two former Saudi ambassadors to the United States, Prince Bandar and Prince Turkey. Prince Bandar was, you know, really came down hard on the Palestinians and said, you know, we've had enough of them. We don't need to worry about them. They've, they've been ungrateful to everything we've done to help them, et cetera, et cetera. Turkey said, you know, we shouldn't have given away this card before we get something from Israel in return on the Palestinian issue. This was, they both spoke out publicly on this. And this is rare. This is the only public debate where the two sides, neither of them were tossed in jail for expressing, <laughs> for expressing their opinions. But, um, but what I think would suggest is that even within the royal family, this is a very delicate issue about whether to uh, establish diplomatic relations. And it's particularly between the senior generation. I think it's between the king and his son. They have a different view on this. So uh, I still doubt that it will be, uh, there'll be any formal recognition before the king passes. Now he's 86, I guess he's 86 now. Um, and not in very health, so it's not it's not necessarily before too many years that um, the, his son MBS can decide on his own whether or not he's going to do. But you, you know, you you have to recognize the king of Saudi Arabia is the custodian of the two holy mosques of Islam, and so and you have two million pilgrims coming to Saudi I mean, you know, this is the center of the Muslim world, religious center. And so it's a much more delicate and complicated issue than it was for the UAE or Bahrain or Morocco or, or uh, so I, I, but I still think that the issue will not come to the head until after the king passes. Ambassador Friedman, let me have you expand on that as well. And I want to throw in one more thing that I learned this week that I was surprised by, and that is that the first year that the Trump administration defunded UNRWA, which is the key UN organization that helps to fund the Palestinians, the Gulf pitched in, and that was a big deal. They stopped, and they will not see any of the UNRWA people at all. <laughs> Certainly this has come to some Saudi's <laughs> attention <laughs> that <laughs> for all of the rhetoric, the, the Saudis are not actually supporting the Palestinians in the way that one might expect. Yeah, well, um, I think there are a whole series of issues here. One is the status of Jerusalem, which is the third uh, holy city, uh, which the Saudis have aspirations uh, to be the custodians of as well. Uh, and its official Saudi position has always been that until the Jerusalem issue is resolved, they will not establish diplomatic relations with Israel. But more important is the issue of the source of legitimacy of Mohammed bin Salman, which is popular opinion. Um, he is not um, an institutional product. 
he is a self-made autocrat, if you will. Um, he has appealed to the public and he receives their support. Um, ordinary Saudis are passionate, uh, not in their affection for Palestinians, they have none at all, uh, but in their uh, repugnance of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of Israel's treatment of the Palestinians. These are fellow Arabs. I sometimes was reminded of Northern liberals during the civil rights struggle uh, who were passionate on behalf of African-American rights, but didn't want to have, had no African-American friends and never would have allowed their daughter to marry one. Um, and uh, there is a good deal of this sort of mixed um, picture uh, in the Gulf Arab and particularly the Saudi relationship with the Palestinians. Uh, the Palestinians, the Palestinian authority is widely regarded with some justification in the Arab world as, as the uh, managers of the Israeli occupation on the US and Israeli payroll and lacking in legitimacy. Um, <laughs> Mahmoud Abbas has no standing at all in the Arab world really and very little with uh, his own people. Uh, so he is kept in power by Israel and the United States, essentially. Uh, so there's not a draw to the Palestinians, uh, but Israeli cruelty to them registers and has a tremendous political impact. It's why the Abraham Accords rest on shaky ground. Um, and uh, so I think this is a far more difficult decision than many people realize. Now, on specifics, Iron Dome um, uh, actually is irrelevant to Saudi Arabian defense. Uh, Saudi Arabia does not face unguided rockets of the sort that Hamas has been able to, or actually Islamic Jihad in Gaza has been able to rain down on, on Israel. It faces drones, which are quite sophisticated and involve Iranian technology. Uh, the only effective defense against drones is uh, available from either China or the United States. Um, the US Marines have a very effective system which uh, enables them to shoot down drones. The Patriot missiles are irrelevant to drones. Yeah. So um, this is a question which, uh, you know, Israel has other technology which the Saudis have, have used to, to their own advantage. For example, uh, police state technology. The, Occupation has enabled Israel to become the world leader in police state technology. And uh, every country in the Gulf uh, has bought this and is using it to surveil its own population. So um, I think uh, the Saudis will be pragmatic. They will buy what they need to from Israel now. There's no, no boycott of Israel anymore um, in terms of commercial transactions. Um, they will cooperate with the Israelis in large measure because the Israelis have a tremendous hold on the US House of Representatives and Senate. Um, and um, having uh, Israeli support is very important if you are under attack for your policies in Yemen or your crimes of murder in Istanbul. Uh, so I think um, the Saudis will hesitate. Uh, this will be an issue that they don't decide. I agree with David for quite a while. Um, and, and, and the reason for that is it's difficult. It's not simple, it's not easy. Uh, final, final point on this is that Saudi Arabia is currently exploring a rapprochement with Iran. One of the most impressive elements of, of Crown Prince Abdullah's reign when, was his, the contrast between his private feelings about Iran, where he practically foamed at the mouth uh, whenever he mentioned them. I had many <laughs> conversations with him. Um, and his immediate actions when he took charge in the kingdom, which were to set aside his personal feelings and pursue on the basis of reason of state, raison d'etat, a rapprochement with Iran, beginning in a meeting at Dakar in Senegal. Um, so um, this is not something that can be ruled out. And the principal glue between the Gulf Arabs and Israel is concerns about Iran. The concerns are actually quite different. Israel's concerned about the Iranian uh, nuclear program costing it 
its nuclear monopoly in the region. The Arab states, for the most part, are concerned about Iran's political influence and ascendancy uh, and its, um, its clients in uh, the broader Arab region. Uh, but still, uh, this is unif something that brings Israel and the Gulf Arabs together, as we've seen in the case of the UAE. Uh, it's something that divides the Arabs, as we've seen in the case of Qatar. Qatar is a country that has no choice. It has to be on good terms with both Saudi Arabia and Iran, and that has been very difficult. But even that is getting easier. So I think this is a very complex question, um, and uh, it is politically very charged in the kingdom. It will not soon be resolved. Okay. Um, David, I wanted to uh, put this question to you. Some colleagues have depicted MBS as a new Saddam Hussein. Do you think this is a valuable comparison? Well, as I point out towards the end of the book, um, I think, I think uh, MBS has two images. And one is the reformer, mm -hmm. the domestic reformer. I think he's unleashed a social revolution, and I say so in the book. Mm -hmm. And more important, it's a secular socialist revolution, which goes right up against the Wahhabi uh, culture. So you have now an incredible clash of cultures inside Saudi Arabia. I mean, <laughs> just the notion that you would one day see women wrestlers <laughs> performing the WWE uh, performing inside Saudi Arabia has to blow your mind if you know or lived in Saudi Arabia in the past. But there is an incredible clash of cultures. And um, this makes him um, very popular, as Chaz has pointed out, with the younger people and with the women. Um, but he has created a police state. And um, this is what we're seeing outside Saudi Arabia is the suppression of all activism, human and political rights groups. And um, this is giving him the image abroad, at least in the United States and Western Europe, mm. of, um, of a kind of royal Saddam Hussein, <laughs> uh, you know, a royal version of Saddam Hussein. So I think he has two images, one at home and one in the West, let's say. And I'd argue that the image at home is the indispensable one. Um, and um, so uh, I think, Dave, I should say something. We have gotten away from talking about David's book, which is really very important. And, you know, I came, I went to Saudi Arabia um, as an innocent. I had never had any interest in fact, quite the contrary. I had never wanted to be involved with the Middle East at all. Uh, every place I went, I both learned the local language um, and many I've forgotten now, um, uh, beginning with Tamil uh, in India. Um, and um, I read everything, literally everything I could find, sometimes thousands of books about the place I was going to. What struck me about Saudi Arabia was there was almost nothing worth reading. Um, it, there was the Robert Lacey's books, which are very insightful. Um, there were some books written by researchers at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem that were very good in terms of their scholarship. But since these people had had no personal contact with Saudis, uh, they lacked uh, the intu intuition. Uh, that comes from what the Germans call finger spitzen gefühl, um, your hand on the pulse of the place. Um, uh, so David's book is really very, very important uh, in, in, because uh, it is not part of the avalanche of polemical writings that uh, emerged after 9-11 uh, or after Jamal Khashoggi's death. Uh, it is a serious effort to look at a society that is full of contradictions, as he points out, uh, that's going through a transformation under 
an unusually complicated leadership. Um, it's very timely um, and, and I think it's unique. Now I might take issue with some of David's judgments, um, but they are honest judgments based on facts. They are not, uh, they are not uh, uh, moralizing or, uh, or polemical in any respect. Uh, so David, I think you did a great job on a hard task and this is a milestone in, and I think others who may be assigned to Saudi Arabia in future uh, to deal with it will have to read your book and we'll get a, a great deal out of it. Thank you, that was, that was great. And he's right, um, it is a very important book and now we have one more on our shelves to read about Saudi Arabia and so we, we all thank you. Um, I, I wanna ask this, um, and some of the other questions allude to it, but um, you you hit it head on at the end of the book. And I think it's the most interesting thing that you tackle. And I'll ask both of you about it. And this it's this notion that here's a country that has so much money, um, you know, is in the right place for the right time, should be able to project its power, should be able to be a, a global power. And yet, it is not. This is what I was getting at before about if he hadn't, if he, you know, if Khashoggi was still alive, would it change things? You know, is there any one act that he does that keeps him off the world stage? And, and David, is it a systemic problem? Is it his problem? Is it a Saudi problem? Why is it that this uh, country cannot project itself? Well, that's the number one conundrum that I outlined in the chapter one. Um, and it's, 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 it's fascinated me in um, trying to figure out why this country it has so many assets, as you point out, and, and religious power and influence and um, um, why it can't project power, why it's failing in, in Yemen, which is, you know, a, you know, personification of their problem. And I, I think there are two main I mean, Chaz may have other ideas, but I two main things strike. Um, they've never tried to build a serious military. The ministers of defense in that country have no have never. I don't think they've ever lit, uh, lifted a, a rifle, let alone had the kind of training that is some of the UAE senior leaders have had military training, and. The Ministry of Defense has been a, seen as a stepping stone on the way to power. It's a political position, not a serious military position for people who have held it for many years, decades. And, um, and their army, their on the ground army is, a, is, is really performs very poorly. Their Air Force is the best and they've taken a hit because they've been blamed for you know, hitting wedding weddings and civilian targets all across Yemen, and um, um, so they have no capacity to project military power. Are, are very limited. Let's put it that way. No exaggeration. Very limited, proven capability to project military power. The other reason, which in my mind is how heavy-handed their diplomacy can be. And boy, have we seen it under uh, Mohammed bin Salman, particularly the way he dealt with uh, Saad Hariri and ordered him to come to Riyadh and, and announce his resignation in Riyadh. <laughs> I mean, it is so heavy-handed. Uh, and I think this kind of alienates, and it's, it's, it's helped to alienate their allies in the Gulf Cooperation Council, I mean, their immediate allies who don't want to give up their any uh, central authority to be in the hands of Saudi Arabia because they don't know what the Saudis are going to do that, that could affect them. And this has affected their missile defense system because they will not join together because they don't want Saudi Arabia to decide when they're going to go to war with uh, Iran or whatever. Um, so, um, They've really been very, and I point, I show a number of cases where they've been very uh, heavy handed. So that's the two, the heavy handedness and the inability to project military power. 
I would I would take a, a slightly different approach. I think uh, um, first I think there's a tendency we have a tendency to talk about world order and world influence as one great homogenous mass, and I think their world influence is multidimensional. Um, in the energy field, Saudi Arabia is a great and effective world power. Um, it has it was the creator of OPEC. It has managed a partnership with the Russians under difficult circumstances. And while it is far from perfect, it has uh, certainly exercised a great deal of influence. Uh, its religious power is greatly curtailed uh, by the fact that it is the home of a very peculiar strain of Islam. Uh, the Protestant version of Islam espoused by Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab uh, in the 18th century, um, which much like the Reformation in, in Europe um, was an effort to take religious faith back to the earliest practices of the, of the religion and strip it of all of the bells and whistles it had acquired over, the, over, the, over its many centuries. But it was unique and it was immediately seen as threatening by the Ottoman Empire and other Muslims. Uh, so Saudi Arabia was born in a way that divorced it from much of the rest of the Muslim world, even as um, it ultimately came to control Mecca and Medina, which are the center. But those weren't the core of the kingdom. Um, they became part of the kingdom only when it on several occasions exploded out. Um, it's notable that the guns in Oman point towards Saudi Arabia, not out to sea. Um, Saudi Arabia has been a, both a vexing puzzle uh, to its uh, five Gulf Cooperation Council neighbors and uh, historically a threat. Um, you know, Qatar is the only other Wahhabi um, uh, state, uh, which is why Saudis take their vacations in Bahrain. Um, but um, it is also uh, a place where the Al Thani, the ruling family, were essentially put in power by the Saudis. Uh, so um, Saudi Arabia is both envied and feared uh, by its immediate neighbors. It is somewhat isolated in the world religiously. Uh, finally, I think there's a key difference here. Much of the world um, is in a state of reaction to Western colonialism, the 500 years of European and American ascendancy, which is now passing, uh, but which had a profound effect. It humiliated people uh, in proud cultures. Um, Arabs in the Levant or in Egypt have a great deal of angst. Uh, this is why they have the sense of humor that they do, which is self-deprecating and they're great raconteurs they have a terrifically amusing sense of humor, very similar to Eastern European Jews, actually. Um, and, uh, and the Saudis, you know, have a different experience. Their experience has been, they, nobody ever colonized them. The West came to them, not as a conqueror, or, but as hired help. Uh, this is pretty important. And more to the point, their history seems to show that the more religiously uptight you are, the more oil comes out of the ground. Um, this is not the experience of Lebanese or Syrians or Egyptians or Libyans or Moroccans. So um, for many reasons, uh, they are very ingrown, inward looking, uh, not well connected with others. It's a final point I will make, and that is that the Arab world, of course, many people in the Arab world write histories of the Arabs. Uh, usually the people who write these are Levantines, they're Syrians, they're Lebanese, they're Egyptians. Um, and there's very little in any of these histories. Uh, Harani, for example, in English, who's been translated into English, is very little about Saudi Arabia. There may be a few pages. And basically, this is because these Arabs take the view that, well, our religion originated there, and then nothing else ever happened there for 14 centuries until this group of Bedouins, who basically probably smelled as worse, as bad as their sheep, um, suddenly, for unknown reasons, became rich. They turned out to have 
to be sitting on most of the world's oil supply. Um, so there's a mixture of envy and contempt, disdain uh, for the Saudis uh, and the Kuwaitis and others. Um, that is a real factor in, I think, gross Arab misunderstanding in, uh, of them. Um, the kingdom has changed radically uh, since King Salman grew up in a mud brick house. Um, his son was an astronaut. Um, another son is now leading the kingdom very much into the wider world. Uh, but this is all new. Uh, the Saudis are terribly poor advocates of their own interests. Um, they are diffident. They shrink from confrontation. They dislike argumentation. This is why uh, someone like Prince Turki al Faisal is so important because he is willing to stand up and say what he thinks. And by the way, David, I think he and Bandar uh, were an officially inspired duet, uh, not dissenting, um, but actually making a key point, which is that the Palestinians are extremely poorly led, um, if they're being led at all, ineffectual, ungrateful uh, to those who have helped them. And in, in Bandar's case, he would argue undeserving. Um, Turkey, of course, took a more nuanced view. Let me go back to David and, and ask this question, um, one that I ask myself a lot, so I'm hoping that you can give me some clarity, and that is why Jamal Khashoggi was killed. Um, there's new reporting that says, you know, his son was under a travel restriction and he had called up the ambassador here to say that he was gonna go see the lawyers for um, you know, the 9-11 families. Um, have you, I mean, you, you kind of put in the, the normal things that people have said about why he might've been killed. None of them are satisfying. Have you thought about it and drawn any conclusions about why he was such a threat? Well, I really think it goes back to his intentions to come to Washington and stand up and criticize Mohammed bin Salman and what he, how, how, how he was spending the king's money. And he wanted to stand up Dawn, Democracy for the Arab World Now, in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and MBS was faced with Jamal, who was writing op-ed pieces for the Washington Post, getting ready to stand up an institution of friends and supporting democratic and human rights in Saudi Arabia in Washington. For, for MBS, this would have been an incredible uh, uh, challenge. And, and Jamal had a lot of credibility. Um, and I think it was something MBS just couldn't face, tolerate as a challenge to him. I mean, given what he's done to anybody else who's challenging him, um, uh, Jamal was the biggest threat to his, he was trying to build an image of himself in the United States, this dynamic young, you know, hipster, really with it on everything, and, um, the, the person that, um, every American company and university should deal with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Jamal was kept jerking his chain. You know, wait a minute, there's a better way to spend our money. Wait a minute, what, why are you throwing all these people in jail? He, he was constantly um, pinpricking, if you will, MBS. And MBS is not somebody who tolerates pinpricks, you know. So that to me was the main reason he had to get rid of, get rid of uh, Jamal. Ambassador, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think it's, it is very perplexing. Um, the question you ask is, is an excellent one. And, and it, it is, uh, Jamal Khashoggi was a Saudi patriot. Um, he approved of the reforms that Mohammed bin Salman was carrying out. He was enthusiastic about those. What he did not like was the concentration of authority, the dismantling of the of government by shura or consensus, 
uh, the concentration of authority in one person uh, and the harshness with which Mohammed bin Salman was pushing through the reforms he was, he was making. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, he was a supporter. On the other hand, he was a severe critic. And the criticism focused, as David said, uh, on the authority of Mohammed bin Salman, uh, not on his modern views. Uh, and this was a challenge, evidently, uh, that was fatal. Indeed. Um, David, in the time that we have left, let's su sort of look at some of the issues that could change relationships with the United States. Mohammed bin Nayef is, a, is one of them. Uh, uh, we have a question, would the release of senior royals such as Mohammed bin Nayef help reestablish the informal consensus model that Ambassador Friedman discussed? And would MBS ever consider doing this? I think there's also a broader question here. Um, you know, is he in bad odor with the United States for a variety of reasons, including this one, that the Americans have always been keen on Mohammed bin Nayef. He was a good partner um, in the in the serious Al Qaeda days. Uh, does that come into MBS's calculations? Well, I, mean, I don't think he's going to be releasing M MBS or anybody else until he's certainly not until he's king. Okay. Until he's king. There's you know, any kind of challenge like coming by freeing people or letting them speak out. I don't think you can tell them. So I think these people are um, going to remain in jail. And uh, I think the future of our relationship with Saudi Arabia it depends now a lot on what happens in the negotiations between the United States and Iran or uh, a return of both sides to the nuclear agreement. Um, if, if it, yeah, you know, if it success, succeeds, then Saudi Arabia really becomes far less important to the United States. And finally, there's an American president, the president can go ahead with a pivot to Asia. <laughs> On the other hand, if it doesn't succeed, then the United States, Biden, has to figure out whether we're going to have to take some military action against Iran uh, to halt its continuing progress towards um, nuclear capability. So in that case, the relationship between the American president and uh, the new king of Saudi Arabia, or the crown prince, could get better because they need each other to deal with Iran. So to me, how things go between the United States and Iran are really key to one key issue and whether relations get better or worse between the United States and Saudi Arabia. So Ambassador Freeman, I'm gonna give you one minute so that we can give David Ottaway, the author of the book that we are um, discussing, the last word. So let me give you the penultimate word. <laughs> On this question, um, as a former ambassador to Saudi Arabia, I would say that there is a false impression that the United States has the ability to determine the succession in the kingdom, uh, that we are uh, the hidden hand that guides Saudi politics. This is not the case. It's even less the case as the United States retreats from the region. As we step back, Saudis and others are being forced to step forward and deal with problems like the problem of Iran in ways that they haven't had to while we fronted for them. Uh, this is why the Saudi relationship with Israel has changed, for example. Um, and uh, so I agree with David, um, uh, our uh, favorite uh, head of the Saudi Ministry of Interior, um, Mohammed bin Nayef, is um, our championing of him would be futile. And David, you do get the last word, and that is, now we know we have to watch what's happening with Iran to see whether uh, there is a full rehabilitation or not. But what else do we need to watch in the short term on how this relationship goes with the United States? Well, I think we're at a point of considerable tension and, and 
we've got to redefine what our relationship is based on in Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis have some very difficult choices coming. And they're way behind in their nuclear program, building nuclear reactors. The UAE is way ahead of them. They've even started, they've completed their first uh, nuclear reactors in the UAE. The Saudis have not made a decision about who's going to build their reactors because they would like to do it with the United States, but we won't allow them to enrich uranium domestically. So they, they made no decision on that. Uh, the Russians would love to do it. <laughs> the Russians would love to sell their Su-35, their most modern plane, um, if the United States will not sell the F-35 to Saudi Arabia the way it's doing to the United Arab Emirates. So there are some really big decisions coming Saudi Arabia is going to have to make. And this is going to affect our relationship. Uh, he can't keep postponing these decisions, particularly the nuclear reactor issue. So I, we, I just think as we withdraw or we're perceived to, to, to withdraw, we're not providing protection for them. Um, um, they have really big decisions about how they want to relate to the United States going forward. Okay, I think we've covered a lot, gentlemen. Um, it's a really great book, David, and I thank you very much. Thank and you. I am honored to be here with the two of you. Ambassador Friedman, you are always a treat. Um, as David says over and over again, um, the professorial, the academic, the intellectual ambassador, Charles Chaz Friedman. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm assuming that you're buying that. Um, thank you very much. Well, and I, I don't know flattery. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank you all for being panelists uh, uh, today with me. It's really, really appreciated. And I want to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for launching the book. Thank Good. you all. And everybody should read it. It's really, really worth reading. <laughs>